I signed up for duty in Yankton, South Dakota on April 13, 1873, and was placed with Company H of the 7th United States Cavalry. Soon after, we relocated to Fort Lincoln, covering a journey of about 500 miles. There, we prepared for the summer expedition known as the Yellowstone Expedition. On August 4th, we engaged in a lively skirmish with the Indians close to the Yellowstone River in Montana, resulting in the deaths of two civilians, including Dr. Hunzinger. The veterinarian of the 7th Cavalry and Mr. Ballerin, the sutler, had both strayed somewhat from the main group as they were keen on studying the plant life in the unfamiliar area. While the 7th Cavalry was stationed at Fort Abraham Lincoln in the winter of 1874, General Custer received word from a scout that a Sioux chief by the name of Rain in the Face was boasting at Standing Rock Agency, 75 miles distant, about killing Hansinger and Belyron. Acting swiftly, General Custer dispatched 50 men led by Captain Tom Custer to apprehend Rain in the Face. I was part of this group. When we arrived at the agency on Ration Day, there were many Sioux gathered. None of us knew Rain in the Face, but a scout provided Captain Custer with a description of him and informed us that he had just entered the sutler's store. Captain Custer and a few men went straight to the store and nabbed Rain in the Face while he was at the counter making a purchase. There was a stir among the Indians, but no one was harmed, and Rain in the Face was safely taken to the guardhouse at Fort Abraham Lincoln to face charges of murder. Later, two civilians who were also imprisoned alongside the Sioux murderer managed to break free from jail. Seizing this opportunity, Rain in the Face also escaped. While in custody, Rain in the Face had developed a close friendship with a private soldier who was imprisoned for a minor garrison offense. This soldier frequently provided Rain in the Face with tobacco and other favors. I mention this because it ties closely to another event related to the massacre. Following his escape, Rain in the Face joined Sitting Bull, the chief of the hostile Sioux. In the spring of 1876, an expedition was organized at Fort Abraham Lincoln, known as the Yellowstone and Big Horn Expedition, under the leadership of the brave General George A. Custer of the 7th Cavalry. I served as a member of Company H in this unit. We journeyed from Fort Lincoln to the Powder River, covering a distance of 500 miles, and established a camp there for a while. While we were stationed at this camp, Major Reno, along with six companies, came across a significant Indian trail during a scouting mission. He quickly returned to inform General Terry, our commanding officer, about the discovery. General Terry established a pack train by selecting two soldiers from each company of the 7th Cavalry to constitute the team. I was part of this detail, serving under Captain McDougall. We prepared our mules in the morning of the 22nd, broke camp around midday and traveled approximately 12 miles before setting up camp again around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The following day, June 23rd, we resumed our journey and covered a distance of about 33 miles. On the 24th, we marched 28 miles. That night, all fires were extinguished and there was no bugle call. After surveying the Indian camp and evaluating the situation, Captain Tom Custer, Captain McDougall, a citizen scout named Charles Reynolds, and a half-breed Sioux scout who had defected from the hostiles to join Custer returned to report to General Custer. Among the soldiers, there was a circulating tale that Sitting Bull had put a bounty of 100 horses on the scalp of this half-breed defector. It was also rumored that this same half-breed had strongly advised General Custer against attacking Sitting Bull at that particular time and location, citing the overwhelming number of Indians. However, Custer dismissed him as a coward. This courageous scout, Mitch Bouillet, accompanied Custer's contingent of five companies but never returned, whether alive or deceased. I vividly recall the initial bugle call on the morning of the 25th, it signaled the officer's assembly, marking the first bugle call since our departure from the Powder River three days prior. The officers gathered around General Custer to receive their directives. As for the specifics of these orders, I cannot say. However, the scene left an indelible impression on me. I can never erase it from memory. Custer's commanding presence was truly remarkable. Even now, I can picture him standing there, a figure of admiration for us all. General Custer proceeded to organize the regiment into three battalions as follows. He retained companies C, E, F, I, and L, along with the regimental staff and band for himself. 
Companies A, G, and M were assigned to Major Reno. The remaining companies D, H, and K were entrusted to F. W. Benteen, who was the captain of Company H and held the rank of Brevet Colonel at the time. General Custer led the charge with his five companies, setting the pace for the attack. Raising his hat in response to their applause as he passed the other soldiers, he exclaimed, Boys, come with me, and tonight we'll relax on our robes. Benteen's command quickly formed in the wake of Custer's advance, with Major Reno's troop trailing behind. The Indian camp was situated across the Little Bighorn River, nestled on the far side of the timber and just ahead of a lengthy bluff, stretching about five miles parallel to the riverbank. The bluff presented a natural obstacle for cavalry due to its steep, rocky sides, making it impassable in most areas. The distance from where the troops split to the spot where Custer aimed to ford the river, situated at the lower and farthest end of the Indian encampment, was approximately seven miles. The final mile of this stretch leading up to the head of the village was fully visible to the Indians. With this clear warning of his approach, the Indians had ample time to concentrate their forces against Custer's battalion, which they likely did. Based on my own observations, it seems that the general came under attack around the middle of the ford, as evidenced by numerous dead horses in the river, indicating that none had made it across to the village on the other side. It's clear that the troopers were shaken by the initial volley and withdrew from the ford to the hills about 300 yards behind. The ground between the ford and the small rise where they made their final stand was littered with fallen soldiers, either singly or in small groups of five or six. On this small, barren yellow rise encircled by a ring of the band's horses, which he had likely shot to create a makeshift barricade, I discovered General Custer. Alongside him were Captain Custer, Boston Custer, who served as the expedition's forage master, and Adjutant General Cook. General Custer had sustained two wounds, one in the right side of his chest and the other above his left eye, near the temple. Blood was still seeping from the wound trickling down his face and mustache, even getting into his mouth. The blood had flowed through his mouth and out the lower side. He hadn't been scalped or otherwise disfigured, except for a single gash on his thigh, around four inches long, which seemed to have been inflicted after his death. His body was stripped bare except for his stockings. Captain Tom Custer's body was severely disfigured, scalped, and stripped. Adjutant Cook, known for his long side whiskers, also had his whiskers scalped off along with other gruesome mutilations. All the other soldiers suffered the same fate, being stripped, scalped, and mutilated, except for one private soldier. This soldier had shown kindness to Rain in the face when the chief was imprisoned at Fort Abraham Lincoln. His body was left untouched except for the removal of his coat, which was carefully placed over his face seemingly to shield it from the sun. I believe Rain in the Face came to the battlefield and ordered the Indians not to harm this soldier's body, and I also believe that if he had seen this soldier, his life would have been spared. With just two exceptions, the entire command of five companies met a tragic end in the massacre. One exception was a Crow Indian scout known as Curly, who arrived at Benteen's command around 9 o'clock on the night of the 25th, causing quite a stir. Initially, we hoped he brought news from Custer but when our interpreters questioned him, he couldn't confirm whether Custer had survived. Many soldiers believed Curley had never actually participated in the battle, but had fled at the first sign of trouble at the ford. The other exception was John Martin, General Custer's orderly bugler who was sent back to Benteen with a dispatch. He informed the soldiers that when he left Custer's side, they were still within sight of the Indians. These were the only two individuals from the entire command who escaped the massacre, and neither of them witnessed the battle. I reckon all the men in General Custer's battalion met their end around two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Not long after that, I witnessed Indians engaging us while wearing the white stable uniforms of our boys. They even rode on the nearby ridges, boldly playing the band instruments in our direction. Additionally, I believe that the Indians engaged General Custer in foot combat because there was only one dead Indian pony in the entire battleground. It's clear to me that any sense of organization vanished after the initial chaos, because the fallen soldiers from all companies were scattered around without any order. These soldiers were simply outnumbered and overwhelmed. I witnessed a row of fallen soldiers, 
about 25 or 30 of them from every company in the battalion, stripped down and messed with. Looks like the squaws arranged it that way. And them Indian children went ahead and shot them full of arrows after the massacre. From the moment the officer's call echoed on the morning of the 25th, Major Reno's troops had about five miles to cover to reach the ford on the left side of the village, aiming to synchronize with Custer's arrival at the ford on the opposite end. After crossing the river without incident, Reno's men faced an open stretch of four to five hundred yards before reaching the woods where the Indians were hidden. Charging across this exposed area, the troopers entered the wooded area only to be met with a devastating barrage of fire from the Indians, causing the horses to panic and retreat uncontrollably. Reno commanded his men to dismount. When the Indians unleashed a second volley, the troopers were told to mount again. However, the situation became so chaotic that the order eventually came for each man to fend for himself. Troopers and Indians found themselves in a chaotic melee, engaging in desperate hand-to-hand -hand combat. Troopers were lassoed from their horses and dragged into the heart of the village, where they were tied to trees and burned alive that night, visible to their comrades from Benteen's division who could do nothing to save them. Benteen's battalion moved towards the center, covering a slightly shorter distance than the other two battalions. Consequently, it brought along the pack train, which had been positioned about a mile behind the center. Benteen's soldiers witnessed the dire situation of Reno's men, and had it not been for Benteen's presence, Reno's command would have suffered the same fate as Custer's. Despite Benteen's intervention, only a few of Reno's brave soldiers managed to escape the deadly ambush across the river and reach Benteen's position. While these devastating events unfolded, I was at the rear with the pack train, located approximately a mile from Benteen's command. We were instructed to join Benteen after a delay of about an hour. Captain McDougall informed us that if the battle was still ongoing upon our arrival, we should form ourselves into a separate company. Upon reaching Benteen's battalion, there was a temporary pause in the fighting. I rode up to the crest of the hill to survey the valley below, when Captain Benteen yelled, Pull back your horse, Adams, or you'll get yourself killed. I followed his command, but I could still see the Indians just beyond the hill, lying as densely as possible on the ground. It was approximately one o'clock when we reached Benteen's position. At that time, we could distinctly hear intense gunfire coming from the right, presumably from Custer's command. Following a brief council among the officers, we promptly set out to locate Custer. We proceeded to the right for no more than half a mile when we encountered a steep ridge resembling a railroad embankment. Just beyond this ridge, an immense number of Indians were lying in ambush. Recognizing the urgent need to assume a defensive stance, Benteen ordered a retreat to our previous position, which offered better defensive capabilities than our current location. This retreat occurred between 2 and 3 o'clock, coinciding with the cessation of firing from the right. One company provided cover for our withdrawal. As soon as the Indians realized our intent to retreat, they began closing in on us from all directions, forcing the last company to hasten back to our lines. The battle raged fiercely from all directions, not relenting until around 8 o'clock that evening. It marked my first experience under such intense fire. By 5 o'clock, most of the men near me had fallen. My bunkmate, George Lell, grievously wounded, desperately pleaded for water, as did the other injured men. So, around five o'clock, volunteers were sought to fetch water from the river. Being unscathed thus far, I stepped forward. Carrying our camp kettles, several of us descended a small ravine, shielded from the Indians' gunfire. At the ravine's end, there was a narrow open space of about 30 yards, directly facing the woods where Reno's men had suffered greatly earlier in the day, and where the Indians lay hidden. One by one we dashed across, filled our kettles from the river, then hurried back to safety and to aid the wounded. To my dismay, just as I was about to enter the ravine with my kettle of water, I felt a jolt, and upon inspection, discovered a bullet had pierced it. I had to fetch a new kettle and make the trip again. Nonetheless, I found solace in witnessing my suffering comrade quench his thirst before his passing, which occurred around 10 o'clock that night. Fighting stopped after 8 o'clock on the evening of the 25th and continued until roughly 4 o'clock on the morning of the 26th. Spotting a group of Indians stealthily moving along a ridge higher than our position, we opened fire on them, 
sparking a fierce battle across the entire front. The engagement continued unabated until about 9 o'clock in the morning, with the Indians displaying tremendous determination in seemingly endless numbers. It appeared to be the direst of situations, but Captain Benteen ordered a charge. Despite the intense hand-to-hand -hand combat that ensued, the Indians eventually faltered and retreated to their previous position. Our unit also withdrew a few yards below the ridge's crest, where we awaited the next development. During this slight adjustment of position, my tentmate Thomas Meadows of West Virginia was struck by a serious wound in his right breast. I tried to carry my wounded comrade back over the ridge, but another bullet struck him in the head, instantly ending his life. I had to let go of his body and rush for cover. Glancing back, I spotted an Indian holding a long stick with feathers, trying to reach Meadows' body. It filled me with disgust, and I can tell you that Indian never dared to try such a thing again. Around four o'clock on the afternoon of the 26th, the Indians began to ease off on their firing, and we could see them starting to pack up as if they were preparing to leave. There were occasional stray shots until sundown, but we paid little attention to them. The terrain where our unit made its final stand was unusual. We were positioned in a large basin with our horses in the center. Along the outer edges of the basin, on the ridgetops, we lay as the Indians had us surrounded and were attacking from all directions. Company H suffered heavier casualties compared to the other companies. There was only one shovel among us. With that, we started to build breastworks as night fell because we believed the Indians might return to fight us to the last man after moving their women and children to safety. But they never came back, likely because their scouts had learned that General Terry was approaching. Early on the morning of the 27th, Generals Terry and Gibbon arrived from the direction of Custer's command, but on the opposite side of the river. They passed close to where Custer was, but they missed him as they went through the former Indian village. Our men welcomed Terry with loud cheers and hat-waving, but when Terry tried to respond, he choked up, sobbed, and completely broke down. Until then, Custer's fate remained a mystery. We transported our wounded across the river to the commands of Generals Gibbon and Terry, while a squad from the remaining 7th Cavalry rode toward the last known whereabouts of Custer. But they never came back, likely because their scouts had learned that General Terry was approaching. Early on the morning of the 27th, Generals Terry and Gibbon arrived from the direction of Custer's command, but on the opposite side of the river. They passed close to where Custer was, but they missed him as they went through the former Indian village. Our men welcomed Terry with loud cheers and hat-waving, but when Terry tried to respond, he choked up, sobbed, and completely broke down. Until then, Custer's fate remained a mystery. We transported our wounded across the river to the commands of Generals Gibbon and Terry, while a squad from the remaining 7th Cavalry rode toward the last known whereabouts of Custer. Led by Captain Benteen and Major Reno, we traversed the bluffs and soon encountered deceased soldiers. We then split up, each of us trying to solve the enigma. Riding somewhat apart from the others and closer to the river, I spotted a small hill covered with dead white horses. Approaching it, I discovered the mortal remains of the brave Custer. Signaling to Captain Benteen, he swiftly joined me. Captain, here's General Custer, I informed him. He said regretfully, that sure looks like General Custer. The entire unit soon gathered at the tragic site, but few words were exchanged. The sole survivor amidst the carnage was Comanche, Captain Keogh's beloved horse. He sat on his hindquarters, front feet touching the ground as we neared. He let out a whinny as we approached. A couple of us dismounted and helped him to stand, then we rode off leaving him to graze weakly. That evening this magnificent old horse, destined for public acclaim, despite being peppered with bullets, made his way into camp. Along with the wounded soldiers, he was transported to the steamboat owned by Terry's unit and taken east. The fallen soldiers from various units were laid to rest wherever they were found, and every officer from Custer's unit received a proper burial. However, when I revisited the battleground two years later, I discovered the remains of the deceased scattered under the sun, with wolves and coyotes having unearthed their bodies. 